on this uh, lovely Thursday evening. Um, so Match Chat Live is a live, real, interactive experience. Uh, we're streaming on Twitter mostly, uh, Periscope, Facebook, and YouTube. So uh, we'd like this to be interactive. So if you have any questions that come up, thoughts, uh, just post on, and we'll uh, hopefully be able to reply uh, when the when the time is right within the conversation. So. Um, Yes, today we have a rather unique experience uh, of a very special part of the curriculum. Uh, both our guests have uh, been in brand new schools and have had the unique opportunity to um, set a curriculum uh, while uh, starting with a completely fresh batch of students uh, who haven't got to the uh, up to the UCSC. So, um, and we're looking, we'll be looking at this kind of vital early secondary part uh, and how to get things right right from the beginning so um so we'll do a quick round of introductions so i'm atul host of math chat live uh, an online tutor teach uh, everything from number bonds to a level maths uh, so we'll be off to you cat first and then sharon yeah, yeah. Uh, so i'm cat potter um i teach at trinity academy in bristol which as you said is a, a new free school and um, we've got year seven and year eight students um and yeah prior to that i was a key stage four coordinator at a different school Brilliant. And, and to Sharon. Hi, sorry, I hope my internet connection is good enough here. We seem to be having a few issues. Um, I am Sharon Malley. I am the curriculum leader for maths at Castle Mead Academy in Leicester. And in exactly the same as Kat, it's a new free school with just year seven and eight. I think we have a slightly larger year group than you do. We have 240 students per year. so um, we're quite we're going to be quite big when we get up to the full five years yeah you're double the size of us we're 120 at the moment and then we're going up to 180 next year fantastic so you've uh, both uh, been spared from uh, <laughs> the assessment season <laughs> that everyone else is in secondary is going through now yeah and i'm very grateful for that <laughs> yeah it was it was a good me it was it's a good me for <laughs> <a good> time <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, from a tutoring point of view, year seven and year eight are so good for me because you get the students at the, um, uh, they're just more mature uh, and primary. They are still the working memory is less, and they are a little, um, yeah, they just haven't learnt enough things. Or, uh, but but year seven and year eight are really great. Two years, year, year seven especially is just a great grounding year in which you can get. Uh, so many other things, uh, the basics, uh, fractions, decimals, percentages, proportion, uh, additive, negative numbers, you get all of that sorted in year seven and you're set. Uh, and all, all you have to do is just add a few new concepts year eight, you just build upon it very, very nicely. Uh, so yeah, if, if I have, uh, it's one of my absolute favorite years, if someone gets in, asks me for year seven, year eight, I already know. I'll be doing this, this, and this, and this, and this, and this. I tell them, this is great, you've contacted me now, <laughs> rather than like halfway <laughs> through year 11, where I really do have to just teach you the test. And um, you know, um, it's, it's it's firefighting, basically, if they, if they haven't got uh, to that point. So, so yeah, brilliant. I'll let you talk about That's really bit. interesting, because I when I took the role, a lot of people were saying, oh, but where you really miss teaching those higher years, as if that was where sort of the good stuff started and actually I found it incredibly interesting teaching year seven and teaching year eight and looking at where it all starts from rather than just that focus on oh you've got to do the hard math now and the GCSE stuff and uh, but a lot of teachers seem to not actually like teaching year seven very much we're quite surprised at people being willing to do it and actually putting themselves in a situation that's all they were teaching I definitely agree about the whole exam thing. Like, I think it's Mel from Just Maths who says, well, like the, the motorway and like year 11 is the fast lane. You can't just constantly be doing that every year, just bit going so crazy. Like you've got to get it sorted earlier on. So yeah, I definitely agree. And yeah, I I had the same thing. Loads of people saying to me, oh, you'll hate it. Especially last year, because I was the only maths teacher and we had mixed attainment. So I had four classes, year seven classes, and it was just year seven, year seven, year seven, year seven, teaching the same lesson four times a day. Um, 
it's brilliant like, i loved it it was just the best cd i could ever have like yeah, i absolutely loved it but people were just convinced that when they actually looked at my timetable they're like wow um, but yeah it's great mm. and what about if there is a how do you put them in sets if there's an attainment gap and uh, how do you how do you deal with that kind of thing when they come in because they come coming to you fresh as a uh, you have to build relationships presumably because they've just just got to you and you have to figure out where they are etc as well yeah. i think this is where we're quite different <laughs> Yeah, well, actually, or now we're the same this year because <laughs> you you started totally mixed ability, didn't you, Kat? Yeah, we we yeah yeah we're in tutor groups and we call it phase one, year seven and year eight. Um, so we just put them in tutor groups. Didn't really have that much idea of prior knowledge and um, yeah, and I just taught them in those tutor groups. Um, and we're slightly changing when we go into year nine. We will be doing some kind of setting. I need to negotiate with science. What we're going to do from now on is we're going to take and kind of nurture group out the ones who were kind of key stage one level maths and put some more support in for those students, kind of a smaller group. Um, but otherwise, we're sticking to mixed attainment um, in phase one, at least, which is year seven and year eight. Yeah, interestingly, when we started in 2019, so our first cohort of year sevens, we went totally setted for the whole school decision and they were setted through all of their subjects using their English, maths and science scores. So they were still had some mixed ability within the class because if you use the key stage two scores, you still get um, that in there. And then because of COVID, when we've taken our new year seven cohort, we've done them all as form groups, um, totally mixed ability. And when we were asked what we wanted to do next year, we've decided we prefer year seven being mixed ability than we do being setted. But that is mostly because we felt it gave much more opportunity to really develop them as a group and set the culture and the type of thinking and not put any limits on anybody and not get any, oh, but I'm only that set, I can't do that, or they're that set and they're much better than we are. And we really liked that coming into secondary and having a level playing field again. And um, that you're all coming in secondary, you all get every opportunity and and we've not put a cap on you at any point um so we we are keep mixed ability for year seven so. I, um, I think the other thing that i because i've tried mixed ability in other other um schools and it went from set to mixed ability which i think is difficult to get right mixed attainment i should say um i think yeah one of the things that we had when the things we had um was we were just told that we were doing it and then like no resources were provided no training it was just happening and so with no resources it's just impossible whereas I think and I'm sure we're going to get onto this later but we both use the white rose scheme of learning and I think those resources work really well for mixed attainment I think um I'm not really a big fan of the word mastery but I guess it is that kind of model like staying on something looking at the really small steps really like going into depth with those who who can um yeah I, I, I love it I think it's brilliant I, I don't I am. I'm, I'm feeling it, a bit... It's been a real revelation. Yeah, same. And I think, I think we were fearful of it because of feeling that we weren't going to meet everyone's needs. But you, in the, any class, it makes us attainment anyway. So you are never meeting everybody's needs. You're just... It's a, it's a very different set of needs now where... You do have some students that need to be much more independent and need to um, just really apply their knowledge and really reason. And um, you have some students who do need some support. And actually, we have done that nurture group. So a, a certain number of children are removed from the general mixed attainment because they are working at a much lower level. And most of the year seven, we have found absolutely fine delivering mixed payment until we got to fractions and adding, subtracting fractions. And then we really started to go, oh, I really wish, this is the one where we're struggling to be in sets because we went backwards and we looked and they first start adding fractions in year four. So if you've already been adding fractions in year four, year five and year six, and you're doing it again in year seven, how do we it was how do we provide enough challenge for the ones who are on their fourth go round with adding fractions but how do we 
support those ones who have had three previous goes and still haven't quite got it. So that's where we re- that was the one topic where we really went, oh, this is, this is tough now. Is um was that before before lockdown or after lockdown or I'm guessing it was, um, it, was it was just as we came back after it was our, our first topic after this last lockdown three um and we were coming back and and we found it part it might have just been we were coming back to school and we were all back in groups together and we weren't sure how it was working so there could have been a lot of reasons for it but as teacher staff we found that the the first the first topic where we went okay we're struggling a little bit with mixed mixed attainment now that's interesting i think i definitely found them coming back from the third lockdown the hardest i think like when they came back a little bit last year I found it fine and then I was really like over preparing for September I was catastrophizing my head and it I I found it fine but I think I was maybe a little bit overconfident that oh we'll be fine when they come back and this one I think has been harder Mm. I guess relatively and I think and that it's it's been so interesting is we've done this where we I've neither of us have ever done a full year in school (laughs) so this has been the two years of the pandemic. I mean, we got to February half term, and then that last that was that's where we complete up to in sort of normal, and then from from then onwards, we've had lots of different things happening, including how we can support moving children into groups, adult support being in the room, being intervention. Everything has then been totally different. So it's really difficult to compare because this is new. And the situation's new and the situation's different and you can't actually work out going, right, what what is the school and the situation because that's totally new and what is the pandemic and how do they, they meet together sometimes to create either a perfect storm or something really useful. So one of the things um, Tap mentioned, both of us separately, which is how we connected, decided to use the White Rose scheme of learning. Um, I've previously been ahead of maths in a all the way through year seven to eleven um, school, where I just adopted the the um, previous head of maths scheme. We developed it, we changed it. The new new GCC came in, so this was the first time to go right. What do we want? And I looked at Kangaroo, and I read Gemma Sherwood's books and her blogs, and looked at her scheme, and then I looked at White Rose, and I looked at and I looked at all of these schemes, what we could buy in, what we could make from scratch, other schools in the trust. And I chose White Rose because it seemed to have all the principles that I wanted to embed into a school, having already done this once before, this job once before, and going, this is what I want. I want students that can think mathematically, that can reason, that get enough, uh, that have interlinked topics, whether it's retrieval. And it was the scheme that seemed to do as much as possible and was well resourced. I definitely agree. For me, I went into a lot of our feeder schools and they were all using White Rose Primary. And I thought, oh, because the bit I was just worried about, and I guess just naturally that the Key Stage 3 kind of lost years and all that kind of thing, and that the idea that we just are rehashing stuff from Key Stage 2. So I was like, look, I want to make sure that I don't do that. So I looked at the primary um, schemes of learning and that seemed really sensible to me to be carrying on with something they were doing. Um, I really liked as well how they started with algebra. I thought that was that really appealed to me because I think just going starting with number and starting with things they've already done, like I think quite a standard thing is kind of starting with place value. And I can understand some higher attaining students thinking, I, I know this. Um, and obviously you can stretch them and we, we do place value, of course we do. But I think starting with algebra just, and it meant everyone kind of had level playing field a bit, a bit more. Um, so yeah, yeah. I, I really liked it. I think. My other reflection as well is working in other schools and I, I I hadn't been a head of department before, but, and I know like lots of this is like curriculum changes, but it just felt like every year we were scrapping our curriculum, starting from scratch, basically chucking the scheme of work in the bin, starting again. And it, it never felt resourced and it felt like everyone was just making their own stuff and spending so much time on it. And I just thought, let's have something where we can be consistent and it has resources with it. And, and I just don't think I, I have, the expertise to create my own scheme of work. Like I, I don't have the hours to do it. I don't have the time to do it justice. And I thought I wanted to pick something that had, had already had so much thought go into it. And yeah, that's what I agree with as well. I mean, I was looking at the, 
Sherwood, I was very tempted by. I was very tempted by Gemma Sherwood's scheme of work. I, when you read her blogs of how she designed it, and she'd done it the whole of year seven being number and focused on building that mastery, and then they bring in... Oh, I think uh, Sean's glitched out. Oh. Pretty cut out now. <laughs> do you like? Do, do I go there? Yeah, we can, um, we can do it. We can do a take too. Yeah. I'm talking about Gemma Sherwood. We can do a take so. too. I was talking about Gemma Sherwood. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I um, really, I just really, really loved the f- amount of thought that she'd put in. And you could see that really, really careful sequencing of building up mastery, getting them really on working on number before you bring in algebra, which then becomes generalized number. Um, it, her blogs and, and work on that and her book was incredible. Felt it's very similar to Kat was I got myself coming into a brand new school where I was learning new routines. How are we going to do it? What we're leading a team. And again, there's no point reinventing a wheel if a really good wheel has already been invented. And so when I went through the white road and I really did fine tooth comb, how is this planned? What's the sequence? What are they What are they building on? What are the types of questions we're looking at? Again, I love the fact it started with algebra, but it's not starting with, oh, you're straight away into solving linear equations. It's starting with generalizing. What is generalized maths? And because I read the reports on the lost years of key stage three, what you don't want to do is just be repeating everything they've already done in year five and year six because you think that they haven't done it well enough. And actually, since we brought in the, the 2014 new curriculum to the primaries, the primaries are doing an amazing job. And the year sixes are doing some incredibly good work. And I know Craig Barton and Joe Morgan have both shared this before. When you compare SATS papers to foundation GCSE or even higher GCSE questions, and the, le- the difference between them is very minimal. So... What are we doing in those? What are we doing in that time? Because we've we've got to take them forwards, rather than just go. Okay, you were supposed to be here at year six. We'll just go there, 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 and and stay around that same level. It's how do we actually go? Right, you already know a lot. You know a lot from primary. So how do we take that forward? And for me, algebra is that real secondary topic that. I kind of wish it wasn't in the in the primary national curriculum at all. I, don't, I wish they did no formal use of letters whatsoever at primary. Algebraic thinking is problem solving. That's fine, but no no use of um, variables at all at primary would be would be my wish. Just so we got to, we got to we got to do that. We got the fun stuff. Yeah, yeah. No, it's. Um... It, yeah, I, I mean, I've seen uh, Gemma Sherwood, Charlotte Hawthorne, I think Pete Mattock as well, uh, just in year seven, uh, they use, mm. uh, I know Charlotte Hawthorne spends a f- substantial amount of time working with those counters and just getting those negative numbers, uh, adding with them, subtracting, what is a negative number, how do you represent a negative number, gets those different things, she does stuff with algebra tiles, there's a lot of stuff that happens in this year seven to get... Um, to get those that kind of generalized algebraic thinking uh, using those representations that will then pay off uh, there's, a, there's a lot of math that's happened until year six I mean, I've seen I've seen like unit conversions uh, forming expressions fractions uh, if you can, you can do that I don't know if, uh, how much of a GCSE have you could do I think I've heard you can do a fair bit of it if you know all all your content up to year six very very well uh, yeah one of my favorite things last year i was I, I met with claire christie who was writing the um i'm trying to the, the maths guidance for key stage one and two the like non-statutory guidance and she wanted to have some um kind of uh experiences from from key stage three teachers and she thought i'd be a particularly interesting one because i was only teaching year seven and she was just talking about the fact that I think like primaries do an amazing job, but there's so much in their curriculum and they have to do little bits of so much. And she was sort of saying like, actually, it's not that great that they spend two weeks on percentages in year six because they don't understand percentages coming out of it. Like they still don't get it. That isn't enough time to do it. And actually 
the, like constantly just seeing little bits of things and just so much just doesn't allow them to build that fluency. And I also reflected that then you have that issue when they come into secondary and they go, oh yeah, well I've done percentages. And you go, you have, you absolutely have, but you haven't mastered percentages and we need to go back over them. And I just loved, I loved her report. I thought it was amazing. Well, I loved the report that was written with her. Um, uh, just that emphasis on like the real kind of fundamentals, just things like she was asking me about some misconceptions and I was just saying students coming in saying like one fifth is 0 0.5. And she was just like, well, that's unforgivable. Like that should have been absolutely so <laughs> difficult for the primary that, that that just shouldn't happen. Uh, but she was saying that the reason it is is because there, there's so much in the primary that they just don't, they can't really focus on those kind of fundamentals, um, which I think is what that guidance is is kind of supporting. And I really enjoyed talking to her about that. But the, the primary teachers are in over such a bind because they have the same issue as we do, which is at the end of year 11, which is that year six is a high stakes year. So the school is judged upon the year six results um, and therefore it's in the same way as we would motorway year 11, as in you have in the fast lane, you have got to be doing this, 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 and this, and you need to get through this, 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 and this. It's we, the, the primaries are in that same position with year six. And actually, that was what was really nice about year seven arriving this September, because they haven't done the SATs. <laughs> and they've missed out on the Trump wedding. Um, but because they hadn't had that SATs pressure, they really were they didn't we didn't have to go through that first term part which we found the year before with our first year year seven which was maths is fun maths is enjoyable we want you to explore numbers we want you to be looking at different ways to do things it's not all about whether you're got it absolutely right first time we want you to enjoy this five-year journey now that you're at the start of and but in maths your your journey doesn't start when you're in year seven, your journey starts when you first hear a number, you start counting the steps as you go up to bed. Um, so we're just putting waypoints in. The, the journey begins as soon as you are a human being who notices different numbers of things. And um, so we we just, we formalize that thinking by saying, oh, you're starting to learn math, but actually you've started it as soon as you can count. Um, there's a lovely story about the experiment they did on babies where they noticed about three month old babies whether if they can count or not. So um, I always tell this to my classes of where number starts from. So um, they've got all their, didn't have, no babies were hurt. Um, so they put the electrodes on them and they show them one teddy bear and the babies go, ooh. And then they show them two teddy bears and the babies go, ooh, different. So they show them three teddy bears and they go, ooh, different again. And the, obviously monitoring all the brainwaves and but, and but after three it's just wow there's loads and um, so four five six seven eight you've just got this lot so they can distinguish between one item two items and three items and after that it's just oh there's a big big group and that's when we first start counting and that is it's innate in us that we recognize numbers but we don't recognize numbers do we we recognize groups <laughs> we recognize items and then we put this number system on top of it to formalize it and then we make them jump through hoops at various points here's your year six hoop to jump through and then here's your year 11 hoop to jump through of can you how have you progressed with your thinking and and i will and year seven i see as the if you've not enjoyed it before let's start enjoying it now yeah definitely yeah yeah, definitely. I think the big thing, a big thing, and I know it's been talked about loads, but just the fact I will get the students to use a calculator pretty much as soon as they walk in the door. And they look at me. Well, it's and, and they just look at me like I am absolutely, like, what are you talking about? You can never, like, that isn't maths. And also, like, even now, when they've been using it for most of the year, for example, in a calculator paper, they just weren't right working. And they're like, there wasn't any working because I used my calculator and I just say to them like you didn't whisper to the calculator what is the answer you, <laughs> the tool you use and you have to explain to me how you use that tool um but that I find really like and I just I, I always try and say to them like I'm not trying to make you into a calculator that is not my job I'm trying to make you and you as a mathematician 
And that isn't just about calculating. Um, one thing that's really exciting this year actually is, well, like we're not in our new building yet. We're in, we're in like a wing of a primary school, um, which is not ideal. <laughs> Um, but one good thing is it means that we can have got good relationships with the primary school. So I'm going to go in and do some, like when the calculator crunch stuff happens this yeah. year, I'm going to go in and I'm going to take all our calculators and like get sort of do some um, sort of beginner's guides to calculators and get them doing some stuff with the calculator. Because I want that, I want a bridge between primary and secondary with that, because I just think they... They spend the first few lessons thinking she doesn't know what she's doing. She needs a calculator, um, and it's just it's it's really interesting. Mm. And actually, what I find really interesting in that is my phrase that I use constantly is calculators are fast. You are intelligent, so you're using it for speed. And if you put in the wrong number, in the calculators are going to say, "Oh, actually, you meant to put zero point zero six, not zero point six there." So do you want to just check that again? The calculator just does whatever you tell it to incredibly fast. But you are intelligent. And so you're, you're, you, when we do non-calculator work, what we're doing is we're making sure that we're intelligent enough to be able to check whether it's about the right amount, whether it's a bit too big, did we expect it to be that? That estimation skill is really what we want. And, and that's when, because like, I've been doing some work with the NCT, um, with the year five to eight continuity groups and I've, I've said the same to my year six and um, primary colleagues said please use calculators please get them using calculators please let them see in calculators because we can't do that thing anymore of why well, you're not going to be walking around with a calculation in your pocket all the time yes you are um, you are you're constantly going to have access to a calculator um, but it's it's learning that it's not cheating it's speed and it's it's using it as a scaffold so we're doing the geometrical thinking topic at the moment lots of angle facts lots of calculations with pie charts i don't want you to be spending lots and lots of time doing the division and the multiplication with the numbers i want you to be which numbers to divide and which numbers to multiply so you can actually think about what the operations are you need to use rather than can i divide this can i multiply this but at the same time i do want you to notice that if you multiply 90 by four, you get 360, and that's a lovely multiplicative link. But I'm not bothered about you being able to do 360 divided by 17, because that would be pointless in terms of your gen general thinking. And, and that does seem to be the disconnect between the sort of the arithmetic work at year six and what we actually want them to be able to do in secondary. I, I don't need them to actually be able to use the long division algorithm. It's quite useful at times, but actually I'd much prefer them to be constantly looking, okay, if I've got four and 360, my link is 90. If I've got 25 and 100, my link is four. And that multiplicative is, is what I want to see. Knowing your timetables, knowing your factors, being able to just quickly spot those patterns, not necessarily be able to chunk your way through Hmm. Every, every bot of and long division algorithm. I mean, I've I've got students now in year eleven doing the assessments, and uh, you know those estimate questions you get. Uh, they're still doing yeah. them exactly. They're like actually like crunching the multi. It's, it's usually like there's a numerator and denominator, there's a multiplication in yeah. the numerator, and then there's a maybe another one in the denominator, and you've got to estimate it. Uh, but uh, <laughs> like they're still actually just. Is that habit left over from primary that you have to work out everything exactly? Uh, and it's you know, an estimate is a ballpark thing. It's a it's a skill set. Is it is it the right area? So um, yeah. And when yeah, and those estimations. Ways, sorry, case cat. When they get zero on the assessment, when it says estimate and they didn't, and they're like, but I did more than that. I did be I did better than estimate. And I'm like, yeah, but you didn't do what it asked you to do. You have to do what it asks you. Um, yeah, definitely. And actually, estimating is a much more powerful life skill when you do have a calculator in your pocket constantly. Uh, if you're walking into a shop and you're going, OK, so they're six pounds and I need 20 of them. And therefore, that's going to be about 120 pounds. But in actual fact, they're five pounds 95 and you need seven, <laughs> 21. It's, it's about that. It's about being able to estimate 
so that you are in the right ballpark, so that you've got an idea about sizes of things. And therefore, when you put it in the calculator and you've put the wrong, the decimal point in the wrong place, you notice it because it's not what expected. That's the intelligence of, of real mathematical thinking rather than just, can I compute? And you saying about fractions and decimals there again, Kat, one of the other things is that a fraction a fraction is a much more accurate exact answer often than a decimal fractions are your friends <laughs> fractions are your friends we always want fractions use fractions yeah fractions is the fraction the negative numbers i think is like that topic that kind of runs through primary into secondary and it's really you want to get that down um, because they are negative numbers especially they are abstract right uh, if they haven't got a grip on them uh, through a representation and you need it to uh, it's it's the one that causes problems all the way later on factorizing with quadratics and multiplying out and you know all that kind of stuff uh, where multiplying two negatives two negatives make a positive well that's you know, uh, um, uh, two negative numbers multiplied have a positive product <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, but they come in to our classroom saying, but miss, I was told two negatives make a positive. In, mm. in what mathematical form? Is that adding? Is that subtracting? Mm. Is that multiplying? Is that dividing? It's, it's, it, it's a great, quick memory tool once you've already done all your thinking and you've got all of the rules and you've got some mental images and representations, but as I said, just a quick two negatives make a positive, it's terrible. Mm. Over over generalizing, isn't it? Mathematicians like to generalize, but that's sometimes I use that as an example of generalizing is very useful, provided you know what all the symbolism does and uh, at a point where you're ready to generalize and you know what the implied symbols like one X and X, yeah, you can, you know, you need, you need, you don't know, know all of these things. Um, but Two negatives makes a positive is a classic case where you've taken the generalization too far to the point that you can't, uh, you know, you've lost meaning. So you have to go, you have to yeah. pull back. You have to like under, <laughs> have to go back and <laughs> actually what it. do you mean by two negatives are positive? Is it when you're multiplying or when you're adding? Is it a negative of a negative? You're an adding and um, so that in itself is an example of like what <laughs> mathematicians shouldn't do, which is to overgeneralize and lose meaning. Uh, um, I think that's my so like it's just my motto in the department. I just never want to have to unteach anything, and obviously they come and I have to unteach some things from primary or from wherever they've got things from. But um, but I just I I'm so trying to be forward facing and just thinking about well, let's look at year eleven. Even if things take longer now, that's fine. But we don't want to have to unteach things. You know, like bid mass. I don't. Yeah. Bid mass because it doesn't work. Why would you use bid mass? It teaches you how to do it wrong. Don't use bid mass. Let's do it properly. Um, that kind of thing. Yeah, definitely. Mm. And, and that is again an overall generalization. Bid mass is a mnemonic. And the only reason it is bid mass other than bin the sir is because you can say it. And so you know, it's that it's a four level hierarchy, not a six. So we've got to, and actually, the brackets isn't even a hierarchy, it's about moving operations up or down by grouping symbols of a three level hierarchy of indices, addition, um, multiplication, I'm going to get wrong now, aren't I? And, and addition and subtraction. Of live maths. <laughs> live maths, get it wrong because I'm very tired. <laughs> If you understand that multiplication division, like any, they're the same thing, you like any division can be rewritten as a multiplication, they're the same thing. Then suddenly, like we use GEMA, so grouping, indices, multiplication and addition, and they know multiplication and division, and they're the same, you know, they're so linked, you can just rewrite either as the other. Um, and same for addition. Um, but I just, I like, yeah, I just don't want to have to unteach that thing that <laughs> doesn't work. Yeah. It's, and it's, I'm exactly the same. And we, we were talking about sort of um, this jobs going around for curriculum leaders and they're saying, well, what's your curriculum vision? And how do you know that your team has it? And I was like, oh, gosh, well, I wrote down my curriculum vision. And then we realised that my curriculum vision is now some really odd little phrases, which is do no harm is one of them. So you never teach anything badly if it's going to have an effect on 
later understanding, so negatives and um, working with order of operations, anything that's going to have a um, negative effect later, you can't do because you want them to have the correct and study. But also our other one that we realised was part of our curriculum vision is math is not magic. So numbers don't appear and disappear from anywhere. They don't, things do, don't just turn into other things. There's always a fundamental law that you can come back to of why it worked and you're applying that. So you're applying an inverse operation. You are multiplying by a reciprocal. You, you are doing, you are using a law. Um, you can only add numbers of the same type. So you can only add fractions of the same denominator. You can only add units with the same units. You can only, so you can only add numbers of the same type. And that goes back to, that's a law. It, it's not, if they're not the same type, you can't add them. So that's simplifying like terms. It's, it's adding thirds. It's working in standard form. Um, every single part of addition comes back to that one dimensional law of what addition is. It's grouping things of the same type together and, and writing it in a simpler way. So if, if, we, if we keep that math is not magic, it's not separate tricks that, oh, well, if you see that, do this. And if you see this, do that. It's, it's actually some really basic laws that you just keep applying all again and again and again, but in different contexts. Not um, floating ping. Remember floating ping? Oh, floating ping. Oh, that's horrific. Um, butterflies for adding fractions. <laughs> yes, what happens when there's three fractions? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, a butterfly with extra wings. <laughs> Two butterflies, I don't know. <laughs> Two butterflies. Um, well, it comes so down to language, doesn't it? And I know that's something you and I both really focus on. Yeah. Just using language correctly. And I still, like I was watching, you know, the Danny Quinn um, vocab um, session that she did. I was watching that and I still find myself saying like, they cancel out. And I'm like, no, they don't. They add to zero. Like they add to zero or they divide and make one. Like, and I just need to make sure that I'm super clear about that. Because mm. otherwise, just like they cancel. Does It's sort of like this magic thing that, but if I'm really clear that they add to zero, that's why that has disappeared. When I'll use yeah. the field axioms with my primary duties, I'll just pop them up and I say there's actually only just additive stuff to do with addition and then stuff to do with multiplication and division is just multiplying uh, as well, really, and Lots adding and subtracting yeah. with the additive inverse. And then you have the axiom that links them up, which is a distributive one, which you can do, you can show them using counters. You have three red ones and then you have a block of those red ones and you multiply them out and three reds and two um, two yellows uh, you can use those as, uh, and I just tell them this the the axioms uh, the commutative law the associative law etc um, they're all based on nothing, nothing is magic everything makes perfect sense uh, it's like what you're saying about the idea of a unit if the unit is a denomination then you can add the same same units together. Uh, it's the same in physics, for example. You can't add speed with time, for example. You can add speed, uh, time, and another time. Um, but it's the same idea that they're familiar. Nothing should be a surprise because they are used to the idea of adding. You're just adding a surge of the same uh, same type instead of uh, and then same again with generalizing later on uh, with imaginary numbers. Uh, um, and this also came up in another Maths Chat Live is um, the same burden that is on primary teachers is also on secondary teachers when you know when a child asks can you do 5 minus 7 well yes you can we are not doing that yet but 5 minus 7 is possible if I, uh, it's the same for us um, we can have we can have negative square roots again um, quadratic equations do have other solutions uh, which are not real they are complex ones but you'll see them later but we're not doing them yet uh, so you know it's all it's always got to be forward facing uh, in all parts of the journey yeah. and, it's, and it's very difficult um, and I really I really um, have a lot of sympathy for the primary colleagues because you don't want to be saying oh yes we're going to do five um, subtract seven if they're not ready for negative numbers yet but it's that it's 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 ha being prepared of how you're going to answer it of at the moment, we're always going, at the moment, we are looking at the difference between the larger number and the smaller number. Actually, it's that, it is that language, is we're looking at the difference. So if you use, 
subtraction is finding the difference, then you are finding the difference between two numbers in a particular order. And actually, you could find the two different two numbers in a different order, but you're not looking at that at the moment because you are staying in the positive realm. Um, a real revelation for me this year, and, it, and I think, as we spoke about at the beginning, just teaching year seven and then teaching seven and eight probably gives you a better grounding for GCSE than teaching GCSE because you're having to consider it so much more of, okay, why am I doing it like this? Why am I teaching it like this? Why am I not just showing them a quick method so that they can do it? Why am I taking the time to really look at why this works? Um, I think it has improved my teaching than teaching a top set year 11, who just have already come in with lots of ideas and you just go, okay, so you take that, do that, blah, blah, and you, it's just manipulation and because you are going back to that grounding, that rules of why does this work? What do you already know from primary? How are we applying that in this situation? And how can we put it together? Um, so that we really do understand it. So my, my big revelation I had never really considered was the um, positive and negative number line is a reflection of each other. So the operations are also reflected. So when you are adding positive, you are becoming more positive. And when you are subtracting, um, and when you are adding negative, you are becoming more negative. And we've got these, and this lovely symmetry of what's happening and in which direction. And why, when you sort of cross the zero line, the world kind of changes, like you've gone through the mirror. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Bernie and, calls it the upside down world of negative numbers. He does it uh, yeah. when he's working with primary students. And he said, if you explain it to them that way, they, they get it because they have, they have the imagination of that upside down world. It, it, and I, I've never considered it like that because I've never, I've never really examined what, what it was, what was happening. And, you know, I got very excited about double-sided counters. I was, I was convinced that double-sided counters were, the, were now going to be the only way to teach um, and with the adjective inverse. But then we started doing it and we really enjoyed it, but we also realised that some children need the number line. And actually, maybe you need both at times and you need both representation and you can't just go, this is brilliant, I'm going totally in this route, but actually different representations have different power and, and using both is not always a bad thing. I definitely agree. I'm still, I love double-sided counters. I really do. But I think my exit strategy for them, I've never got quite right. I use, like, I do show, um, uh, like, that subtraction can be, re um, any subtraction can be rewritten as adding the adjective inverse. I've shown them all that. We spent lessons on it. And, but I find it, I don't know, I've never quite got it them fluent with it. And I feel like it always feels a bit resistant. And I just, and it, it makes so much sense to me because I feel like it really eliminates that whole, you know, when you're like uh, collecting like terms and then like, is this a negative or is it a subtract? And I'm like, oh, okay. Like it makes so much sense to me, but I've never quite got it. Right. So, yeah, and I, I definitely agree about showing the number lines as well. 100%. Yeah, you can use a, a, the vector one, essentially, when the number line is, for me, is directed number is a vector representation because uh, you, you can introduce them to, uh, I introduce them to them in primary, they roll a dice and they move the vector arrow. Uh, uh, mm. So they're getting used to the directionality of the number. Uh, and with the difference, yeah, if you have the vector, one vector going this way and the other vector going that way, the difference is really the difference between the two, so head, head to tail and so you can use you can use a whole bunch of different representation and uh, uh, like a, each new representation adds to your understanding adds to my understanding it definitely adds to their understanding uh, so it's like oh positive and negative counters which are which are fantastic I should say even for physics and chemistry because we'll be doing positive and negative charged ions and things like that mm. uh, so it's definitely a very very good one to use um, you can use the directed number line and you can even if they completely get it with the counters you can at some point later you can use the directed number line because that's going to build on to vectors later on anyway uh, or you can start with vectors and then have the counters later so there's no it just depends on who is in front of you what works for them at that time um, 
and each each new representation yeah just i call it like you're looking at a going back to my sort of engineering architecture background you're looking at another projection of that building you're looking at it from that angle that angle that angle each representation gives you a new viewpoint and then you get a much much richer image and idea of that concept and and going back to what one of your students said as well like oh, are we done with percentages I, I get that with us well like we're done with percentages I said we are never done with anything like we can do place value <laughs> in multiple bases we can do counting oh. in multiple bases we can do everything for like forever if we wanted to uh, we just learned a, this bit of it and that's what's examined at GCSC and then if you want to learn more of it you can do it at A level if you want to learn you're never done with any topic every topic is um, you can explore it uh, forever really yeah and, and I think that's been the real joy of it's about going back to basics that makes you really understand how stuff works. So um, place value, when we were in sets in that first year, when we had, so I had a very good top set, but I was we were all following the same scheme. We weren't racing them through it because do that. So we got to the place value unit and I was a bit, think they can do most of this work already. So we explored the same work that we were doing base 10 in different bases so that and i remember very clearly one boy sitting there and going i thought i understood how numbers worked and now i'm not sure whether i do or not <laughs> and this is someone who'd come all the way from primary being you know that one in the class is really good and can do everything and showing him how binary and um we might have gone on to hexadecimal um worked was just utterly mind-blowing of oh because those students that are really good have never had to think well that's the tens column ones column and that's the tens column and that's the hundreds column it's been almost like they just they just knew it without having to think about it so when you make it harder deliberately and they have to really consider what is that digit representing because i know my my numbers have just disappeared from what I knew before it then they look back at base 10 and go oh I never really considered what a nine represented before because <laughs> now I know I loved um I totally agree I went to one of Mark McCourt's like training sessions yeah uh, I just I hadn't understood algebra until I understood basis because I'd never thought about why it's one x x squared x cubed. and then once you do basis you're like of course like it, it Obviously it is like, of course that links, but, but ne because I'd never worked in different bases at school, I it just, I just didn't understand it. And I was like, oh my gosh, that is amazing. Mm. What I love that is that going deeper makes you then come back and look at what you already knew. And I was like, oh, that's why columns addition and subtraction works. That's why, I mean, have you shown um, column subtraction where you make it negatives instead of exchanging? I mean, because that's great. That uh, blows their mind. It's really good. Pre, so, pre digit uh, subtraction. Uh, yeah. Pre algebra, digit by digit so, subtraction. Yeah. yeah. So you do. So you do a column subtraction, but instead of exchanging into the different columns, if you've got three subtract um, five, you just put negative two in the column, and then like, I, I, am, am I allowed to do that? And you know, right, well, what does that represent? Well, that means I've got to subtract twenty, and in the tens column, and they just uh, because you've never done it you've always exchanged over so that you've got enough so you can subtract them but then when you show that it works out as the right number even doing that there's just this but but but, but everything you told us i've ever learned before is now out the window <laughs> um i had rob smith from so um part of LaSalle um come and do a training session for my tra my math trainees and he got them to do the 1089 problem in um 1089 and um, problem in different bases and this is people who are have a bit of plight of training as math teachers and all of them their heads were it was the it was the emoji it was the brain exploding of how is this working in different bases and i've never considered it um it, it, it's brilliant and it really shows how we've got to go deep with math teachers and, and i hope i've not got a math degree so i'm a scientist no i haven't either yeah i think we're all imposters <laughs> then i've got an engineering degree so <laughs> So, 
but does it stop us understanding the math to the right degree? What I worry about is is my preparation for A-level, and I, I'd really need to make sure... Um, I've, I've got Chris Shaw, of, um, who's working at Loughborough University at the moment, is going to come and do some work for my trainees on A-level. And I keep... Every time I'm thinking, I'm like, I feel like when we get up to, say, year 10, I need to start doing some A-level work so that I... I'm prepping in that direction as well because I'm now very confident about what's on the primary um, scheme and primary curriculum and how we build up from there. But am I make absolutely making sure that we're preparing them for the next stage and the next stage after that? I feel the same because I just, my old, my last school, I didn't teach, like my first couple of schools I taught A-level, but my last school I didn't. And so I missed all the new curriculum stuff in interval so I, ha I haven't taught that before and I'm like oh actually that's going to be like a really long time um and yeah I absolutely agree with that hmm. you should tune into we've got another one a level mass chat live uh, planned where um uh, I think Sheena and Matman are giving a talk about this bridging stage between um GCSE and a level um because next year's cohort will have missed stuff as well because of uh, everything so to get that bridging it's very similar to this bridging essentially we're talking about as well right between primary and secondary yeah. so you have the same bridging uh, i'd be worth worth tuning into um i, I mean yeah, i have the same well. mm, dilemma as well uh, i mean i teach a level maths but i don't teach a level further maths so this is next year will be the first year i'll be doing a level further so i'm like the same anxiety around <laughs> like, you know, we, we all have it at any level like if you were going to do it go ahead, teach degree level maths or prepare them for a degree thing or for an any stem one um but yeah the earliest maths is the most fascinating you know what the, what what is a number how do you put them into these numbers digits and numerals when mark mccord talked about it it's like i've never thought about it like it, no yeah. it, it's fascinating isn't it that that we, what we call a number is actually a numeral or digits or it, it's not a number you can't have a number if you haven't got some stuff and mm. um, and we just i think for me a lot i i really think about early careers teachers here because i feel like i went for a long time of teaching without knowing a lot of things that i should have known and that's what's been amazing about twitter amazing about um all the, the resources that are shared the communities there because if you're involved you are constantly working on your subject knowledge you are examining things in different ways why does that work why does that not work why how does that link and um it, i just hope that we've really got that happening in every school um because i know it's happening in areas but it, it does concern me that you could very easily begin begin teaching maths without having been exposed to very much in terms of mathematical knowledge I which think i think is different yeah, I absolutely agree. I think it's why they, I'm so passionate about the fact that I love how resourced where Rose is and how my department is is and is going to be. Um, because I feel like early careers teachers, like as, well, when I was an NQT, I made everything from scratch, every resource, every or, or maybe I'd find them on TS, but there was nothing there ready that I knew I could use that would be of good quality. And therefore, like you don't have time to go and like your planning then sort of becomes like resourcing rather than really planning and you just you just don't have time um so I, I i really like the fact that i'm gonna have two nqts next year and i've got itt students at the moment but the focus is like this is good and this will work but you need to really understand it and script your explanations and you need to be ready and really have thought about the misconceptions and that kind of thing one thing one thing we do as well we have um i'm leading on it and my school is co-planning and I've really focused on, because I think this can go horribly wrong. Because to me, it's one of those things you shouldn't really do as a teacher. I, I guess I start with like the non-examples of it. I just say like, it's not a department meeting. It's not admin. No admin is allowed. It's also, I don't know if you guys remember, I, I've definitely had times where we had to like cope on a lesson and it ended up like one person made one slide and then the other person made the next slide and then you'd put them together and be like, okay, well, we've planned together. Um, and so I, I say like, it's not that. And I, I often say, I don't think co-planning a lesson is the right unit of time. Cause I think you can obsess about the logistics and what am I going to do for the starter? But instead we do co-planning sessions about 
either about like tiny little small steps, really, really small things, or about like a whole topic and looking at it in sort of more broadly. But really, I think that co-planning is so important. Just thinking about questions, doing maths together, really thinking about what are the key kind of points. It's that choice of, it's, it's to the point of what numbers are you going to choose to demonstrate this particular issue because even white rose as far as good as it is still gets it wrong because they've put they did a lovely pie chart where three quarters of it was shaded in and um and one shade one three quarters gray one quarter white and it was um the whole represents 300 how much what proport how many is how many does is the shaded section represent now the issue was that a quarter of 300 is 75 and three quarters were shaded in which is 75 percent so you then have this number 75 which is being used for two very different things but be becomes a misconception because of the choice of it was 300 for the whole 400 for the whole would have been five we wouldn't have had any confusion with what the 75 represented. The 75% is the um, proportion of the whole, in, and the amount is, I can't even work, 300 rather than uh, three quarters of 400, rather than three quarters of 300 is 225 with 75 as that. And it, it really caused some issues because of the choice of number. And until you're doing that live and you go, oh, we've got a problem here. Why is it that? Why is it not that? That you don't see it. And it, you're always going to have that happen. And it, it was live in the lesson. And, you know, girl put a hand up and went, but isn't it 75%, not three lots of 75? And <laughs> you've got that issue. So choosing your numbers is, is as important as anything. Definitely. Oh, I think you've glitched again. I've lost you. You're back, you're back. Um, uh, you're back, okay. Um, yeah. There's a question by Margaret Allen from quite a while back, actually. What is the calculator crunch? Uh, um, so yeah, really good question. Um, I think it's MEI that create them. I think I want to say Alison Hopper, but I'm, I might be wrong. Um, it's um, MEI create. Yes, it's Alison Hopper. Yeah, um, they. She works a lot with stage two and three transition, and the calculator crunch is. I think it's sort of ten days worth of activities for year sixes to be doing with calculators. Um, yeah, that's that's what that is. Ah, fantastic! I didn't know that. Okay. Um... So yeah, if anyone else has uh, any questions or comments, do do keep them coming. Uh, we, we had a couple of screen share tests, so maybe you can take us through some of the actual uh, uh, yeah, actual nuts and bolts of some of your planning and uh, things you found here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, do you want to start? Yeah. Um, I can start with a few. I've just picked a few kind of um, a, a few bits. See, so, yeah, I'm I'm happy to do that. Um, so. Can you see this? Yeah, it's very good. Perfect. Okay, so um, this is our essential knowledge quiz. What we do, um, one of the key kind of focuses at Trinity is that assessment is cumulative, um, but also that we have a real big focus on knowledge. And I think um, one essentially we assess students every week, and they're sort of low stakes assessments that students mark themselves. Um, and one once a fortnight, but once a fortnight they'll have an essential knowledge quiz and this one essentially they've got the same i say it's 12 questions because of the fraction decimal percentage table it's more than that really but they've got these questions and it's the same ones every single time i move them around um but it's the same same questions and the things are like i really spoke to science about the issues with uh, metric conversions um we um 
things it, essentially for me it's the things where I'm going to have a little cry in the corner if they in year 11 say to me oh what's that again and I'm going to go oh my word um so I want to make sure that they absolutely know this know this stuff um so yes yeah, so prime numbers factors multiples um I really like one about x multiplied by x and x plus x just to make sure they've absolutely got that and because it's going to be the exact same questions each time there's not it's not my God, I didn't understand it. You know, like it's whatever effort you put into it, hopefully you're going to see some reward. And even even some kind of really low priority students, even if, you know, they get one and then the next time they get two, that's amazing. To me, it's really focused on, we tier our students and we would, we'd say like tier one and the students who really needs extra support, they're probably like below 90 on SATs, really, maybe even like key stage one level, all the way up to tier five, and it's kind of following a normal distribution. Um, and these for me are like pitched at the tier ones and tier twos, really, like the, the rest of them will probably be fine on these. But this is, I really, really want everyone to know it. And the culture in the group when we're doing this is that we want everyone to get 100%. And we're not happy to stop doing these until everyone's got 100%. Um, so this is something that I really like um, and I've, ne I've never done quizzes like this before where it's literally the same questions and I've tried to distill so clearly the stuff that they have to know. I, I try and make it really clear to them as well that this is just stuff that is going to make their life so much easier in every math lesson if they know this and don't have to kind of think about it, they just know it. Um, and then um, I've also got the other, um, so the following week, they'd also have a low stakes quiz which is more kind of a traditional quiz so what we do is we have some um keywords or key definitions we have like the first half is going to be a recap from previous terms um, and what you're trying to do is try and be clever about it like if we're about to do solving inequalities i'll make sure that there's an equation on there so that i can kind of diagnose and know what i need to reteach and so i also do stuff like every question has a hegarty clip attached so we use hegarty and it just means we will do some class feedback but if students get this wrong then they know absolutely where they can go and it's you know they they can take responsibility for that and then later on we have kind of the recent topics um so this this is one of the year seven ones um and yeah that's that's kind of how we assess and then and i will stop talking in a second and then we'll do some whole class feedback on it so we did a year eight one where we, there were a few spellings they got wrong a few bits of knowledge that not all of them had and then straight line graphs they'd forgotten so we're just going to reteach some of that and, and this is kind of what the feedback will look like um so yeah that's that's a little bit about how we kind of assess and some key knowledge at trinity i really like that i think you've, i think there's that that specifying the key knowledge and it's something that i had planned to do and covid has just went oh it's a, it was on my and it's it just gone right down um to the bottom <laughs> in all honesty and so i'm going to be emailing you can go can i have those <laughs> perfect it's so easy as well because once you've done it like it's literally just moving them around because like the other yeah. quizzes when it gets to this i'm like oh okay i've got to go and write it but these ones it's, it's just so that one nice and easy um, i noticed you put the confidence rating on those questions as well so on the other quiz so that you get them to so i've, I've heard craig barton speak about that of putting how confident you are so how do you use that once they've done it or is that just for them so it's it's partly for them i think what we tend to do is they they do the quiz it'll take about 15 minutes they mark it and and we definitely sort of mention the confidence ratings and just sort of like oh it's just kind of highlighting the difference between getting something wrong that you're a five on and getting something wrong that, or getting something correct that you're a zero on like they're they're really interesting kind of cases we probably could do more with them i find them more useful because what we do with the quizzes is we take them in afterwards and this is our marking we don't mark books but we look at these and we analyze them and we say okay well where where are the issues what do we need to do which is where this whole class feedback comes in and i find the confidence ratings really interesting then um just to kind of and I'm, I'm not massively like systematic about it but i look through it and as i'm looking through it, it's just really interesting to see who may be overconfident about some areas or underconfident um and i yeah i'm gonna get it wrong now but like the hyper correction effect that craig yeah Barton, i was gonna just mention that but yeah you've got got gone straight into the hyper correction effect yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna explain it wrong though so someone else explain it because i'm gonna get it wrong <laughs> No, I think it's it's when you've been really confident on something and then you get it wrong and knowing that you've been really confident on it is 
gets that hyper correction of oh and and you learn it better because you am i you, is that what you think at all am I? <laughs> yeah i mean it's not just maths it's like when you think yeah. you're really really right about something and then suddenly you find out that you're wrong it, it sends a shock it's like yeah. I, I better find out what the real truth is because it's because you you're more sensitized and alert because you've had that emotional shock that oh my god i got this wrong i really thought this was this and it's not um, so uh, that's that's the word hyper you get it swings yeah. the other way and then you you correct uh, as opposed to a kind of get, had a guess at this a kind mm-hmm. of vague sense of what this is and i've just guessed and uh, you you're, you're not as alert to correcting correcting it then uh, as you are from a yeah so it can yeah be used it to, makes it does make sense um, I will share um, one of my um, vocabulary knowledge organisers. Um, it's just the one we use right at the beginning of year seven. Can you see that okay? Um, Looks good. Yeah. Um, anyone who's seen me on Twitter might see my um, etymology of mathematical words that got sent around quite a lot because I was utterly obsessed with that. And I think it. Um, I did the Greek and Latin roots and where they would use and um, got that. But I, I did, we did produce one for each unit that we do. And it was really to ensure that not only the students knew the correct terminology, but also the staff were using the correct terminology without saying, make sure you are using the correct word. <laughs> because um, I had a slightly bigger team. So there was two of us in the first year um, when we just got year seven and now it's four of us and next year will be six. So, Getting that consistency when you're very small is a team of staff is quite easy. But when you're growing, you've got to make sure that everyone's on the same page, literally. Um, and it's also with making sure we have a lot of students that come um, who ha- don't have English as their first language, they're new to English. And we want them to be using the terminology straight away in as much as we can correctly and, and knowing that there is a definition. and. It's not so, I mean, I think the only one that would be in this one that would be um, in any way confusing would be different. And um, one of my favorite um, education books, which isn't isn't as widely known as it should be, is um, the problem with math, because it's American, is English. And it's by Concepcion Molina. Um, I am obsessed with this book. I think it's one of, I think all math teachers should read it because when you are a learner of math, you're a learner of two languages. You are a learner of the mathematical language in symbolic form, but also using the English language in a different way, which is where you have polysemous words like difference, which has a meaning in general English and then a very specific meaning in math. And when we say difference in math, this is what we are talking about. We are talking about the results of subtracting two numbers. But what you realise you're doing is you're using the word different in normal. What's, what's different between these two triangles? What's the difference between these two problems? And then you're going, okay, what is the difference between these two numbers? And you're constantly code switching, which is very confusing. Um, it's quite an advanced level language um, idea to be able to be both code switching in terms of symbolic and um, verbalized as well as I'm using this word in this context in this situation and I'm using it in a totally different context in another situation Um, and there's quite a lot of words like this so factor um, similar is horrific in mathematical terms (laughs) because a similar shape is not one that just looks a little bit like it um, we had yesterday. We had the regular is just like of oh, the normal one. <laughs> Standard. Standard, just the one you usually see. My favourite ever exam question answer. I wish I could show you the shape, but it was like an irregular, I don't know, hexagon, and it was like, is this regular or not? Why? And they were like, it's not because I have never seen this shape before in my life. <laughs> I have seen a lot of shapes, and I just I, I thought it was hilarious. <laughs> mm. And it is that vocabulary just has such a specific mathematical meaning, but it's so differently used. And I've just used difference again. I mean, it, you're using it all the time. Um, it's, like, it's things like evaluate, then, evaluate in history or English or something. That's like really complex, top of the blooms, like really, really tough. Whereas for us, it's just, all right, find the value. Check it out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
and in actual fact, it's quite similar meaning, as in find the value, but it's just an easier, it's easier to do it when you've got loads of numbers than it is when you've got an entire um, historical maybe piece of writing to evaluate. Um, so that's quite an advanced, yeah, as you say, it's quite an advanced skill. But yeah, how, how it changes that vocabulary in different um, contexts and being really aware of that and, and making the students aware of that. When I use this in a math lesson, it means this. This is what we're talking about, a product, a factor, um, expand. Yeah. <laughs> When physics so expand means expand. <laughs> See, they're doing physics as well. So in physics, an expanding gas means literally an expanding gas. <laughs> expanding volume, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the, the mathematical vocabulary is just is incredible. And um, so I think if we define it to start with and then use the correct vocabulary as well. I mean, I've never used the word com commutativity as much as I have done in the last two years, or, um, and now we need a bit of distributive and associativity. Um, but year sevens can understand it. They understand what commutativity is, why it applies, and, and why wouldn't they? Um, and there's a word for it. There is an actual word that means yeah. um, two plus three equals three multiplied by two. And I think like, Previous me might have thought, oh, well, what, like, they don't need it for an exam. I don't really know if that's, like, why would I choose to spend time on that? But then, like, now, I don't have those hands up of, like, I got 2 plus 4x, and you've written 4x plus 2. Am I right? Like, they're like, well, and, and if a student will ask that, I will hear a student go, of course, that's the same. They're commu like, addition is commutative. And it's just, it's brilliant. It's, like, that shortcut and that real understanding. Like, I, yeah, I love it. And, and actually using that vocabulary and using it accurately, you are, you're defining it so much more because you're saying, well, this is an actual thing. This is an actual rule. It's an actual law. It's not just, oh, remember, when you multiply, it can be either way round. It's, oh, no, multiplication is commutative. It's, it is not, well, when am I allowed to do that? When am I not allowed to do that? You, it is. Mm -hmm. And so you... <laughs> You're let, making it less woolly and less, oh, it, oh, well, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And you've got to remember when it does and when it doesn't. It, this is what it is. And therefore, you apply those rules. Like we were talking about addition earlier. If you know what can be done with addition and you know that there are certain rules that apply, you just apply them again and again, rather than it being, what, what's my special case here? Is this the thing when I do that thing? Or is it when I do the thing when I do the other thing? Um, and it all just being lots of disconnected methods. So much to remember than them. A, Yeah, too much to remember. Mm. This is, yeah, well, this is this is fantastic because you can use, and it's really good to introduce this early on because, um, yeah, not knowing what the actual phrase really relates to. Uh, we see this come up again and again in year 11, um, or GCSE exams, isn't it? Just not knowing. Uh, yeah ascending descending even sometimes uh, yeah and and very very simple things and and seeing that we know and so <laughs> i think there's a, the other thing of making sure that they trust us that we we're not just math magicians pulling things out of the air there's, there's a body of knowledge which backs it all up that we actually really truly have something that we're using that this is what we want you to know as well and and when sort of knowledge organizers first got bandied around i was very much it's a revision guide by any other name um but knowing how to use it and what to use it for and what's useful for your subject so if i if i i see it as i want this knowledge defined so this is why it's in a knowledge organizer if it needs to be defined if i want to teach a method i'm doing i'm going to use something else um, it's not a knowledge organizer. It's about this is these are the rules. Oh, these are this is what this word means, not just the entire GCSE maths in a CGP book. Um, that's something different. But you know, you've got lethal mutations. So <laughs> a knowledge organizer is now a piece of paper with any knowledge on it. 
Yes, another method for another thing, for another case, special case. <laughs> factorizing this yeah. in this way, factorizing yeah. that in this way. Well, factorize <laughs> just means one, the one thing. That's true. Yeah. Uh, and if you know what factorize means, let's look at how we apply that. And actually, factorize is really difficult when you're talking about whether it's algebraic factorization or numerical factorizing, because of whether you can use... Um, I remember um, Tom Frankham and I having a Twitter chat about this of um, when can it, when does it have to be a whole number? So when, does, yeah, when does it have to be an integer factor? Actual mm. factor. Um, because you can. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can use, uh, well, algebra tiles are great for that, aren't they? If you can just factorize numbers. Yeah. Uh, and within the quadratic, there's the the number bit factorizing as well on the on the bottom right corner um, yeah so it's a it's a great consistent representation that goes with the the unit the yellow tile itself yeah. and the x square tiles and um it's so provided they understand the type of factorizing they're doing with the area model you link it up with the area model it doesn't really matter if you use numbers or uh, quadratics mm. etc yeah, yeah. No, it's so, it's so true, and and actually, oh, I should stop screen sharing, shouldn't we? Just we just start staring staring at it now. Um, I forgot it was only on my screen. Um, using fact um algebra tiles, using oh um, Jonathan Johnny Hall's brilliant new prime fact tile. <gasps> Can't wait for that topic to come up in year seven. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Because that was a lockdown topic before, so we didn't prob we didn't teach it in in, a, in the way. So this is like our first opportunity to really get into prime factors, and that is one of my favourite things. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. It's a really good topic. Yeah, I use that um, animated factorising dots where they are changing around, and you you group them. I get them to group them with the counters first manually. You say actually, yeah, here's a video. <laughs> you can see all of it just. Oh, the the factor conga where it constantly keeps moving into the different shapes as you. I love yeah. that video. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can I can watch that. Uh, that's you know that's a great representation. And then you have the prime factor tiles when they make the work and uh, Johnny's site. Um, many many ways of doing it, but ultimately it comes down to again just understanding the structure. What is primeness? What is factors? While well, you can put the primeness and the factor together, what what does it mean? To multiply and then how useful it is once you've done that and how you know how many other the areas of math that kind of i always think of it's the dna of a number once you've got what well, if you once you went down to its prime factor you can you can see everything that's a really good way of putting it yeah 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 the dna definitely pinch that Mm, yeah, yeah. I mean, well it is because cause you can then find all the other factors of it and you can put them back together in different ways but you you can't go any further than that you've got that basic building box it really links to chemistry as well with sort of your atomic structure and how of molecules that and you can tell that I did science at some point um, and then it's getting it down to its basic form of well what is it what is it made up of and um, how and you can't break it down well you can obviously with atoms um, break it down further than that, but you could with um, prime factors going into decimals, but we don't. We stay at this sort of pure form. Mm. Yeah. I might have to um, bow out very soon because I have. Yeah, um... no, no, no. There's uh, not, many, <laughs> not many questions coming in. Uh, I think everyone's just uh, overwhelmed by uh, marking and assessment. Uh... I was going to say you've got it because we're not doing any tags or tags. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that's uh, that's great. It's a nice, nice kind of place to wrap up. We've seen. Um, so, if you have any any of those links to share, that'd be great as well. I can just tag them on okay. to the back of that tweet. Um, but uh, yeah, we could, we could kind of wrap up there. And so again, thanks for your time. And uh, yeah, year seven, year eight is just such a such a great place to uh, get everything set in place. Uh, that vocabulary thing is is great. You can just bring it back and those uh, that that same test that you had uh, x times x x plus x that's like stock marks i see students losing them at <laughs> gcsc and you can use the same one again and again because you have the forgetting curve um so that uh, spiral review uh this is really great ideas that i've just picked up from just looking at those two two documents alone 
Um, fantastic. So the recording will be there. So if, if you have any questions uh, while you're watching the recording, I'll make an audio only version as well. So um, yeah, let's post them on this tweet itself. I'll tag, tag either any one of us. Um, and um, yeah, we'll be back again next week. So uh, I'm going to stop this uh, live stream and we'll just have a quick debrief and we can, we can wrap up there. So uh, thanks everyone. Uh, just a, a quick wave for that last uh, last time. Thanks. <laughs>